Hello, welcome back to the Impact Lounge with your weekly Impact Review. I'm your host, Adam, and as always, I'm joined by Ro. How are you doing, Ro? How you doing, Adam? Welcome back. Yeah, great. I'm doing really well. Two fantastic weeks in Cancun there, enjoying your uh, North American weather or Central American weather, I should say. Uh, so, yeah, all good. It's uh, I've been catching up on impacts as i've been back watch this week's show and i've got to say they they seem to have saved the really good episodes so when i was away doesn't seem fair does it there you go so what, what's been going on at the impact lounge since i've been away anything exciting uh you know what it was nice and gotta thank bq for taking the time from his busy schedule to fill in while you were on your vacation but uh we've had the opportunity to cover two excellent episodes of impact Fantastic. And on that note, by the way, I know listening back over the show that uh, BQ went to Rise of the Knockouts um, at, down in, was it New Orleans or Chicago? I can't remember where he traveled to for it. Uh, I'm going to be going to the UK tapings when they do that at MediaCon this year. So hopefully we'll get some interviews on the back of that and I'll give you an update on, on the live show as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, nice to be back. And uh, yeah, we, we're going to go back to the, the regular format. So I know last week BQ did have a trivia question for you, but we are uh, going to go back to the trivia question, answer some of your questions that you've left us in the comments from last week and weeks before, and obviously dive into the review. So uh, yeah, we're going to start off with the trivia question, the return of the trivia question, as I'm sure you all missed it last week. Um, it's going to be, I was going to say quite a simple one this week. I didn't know the answer, so I had to look it up. But uh, I thought we would dive right back to the beginning for Bound for Glory, the very first one in 2005. And what I want to know is, uh, what was the main event? Uh, it's as simple as that this week. What was the main event and who was the special guest referee? So that's all you need to let us know in the comments section below. See if you can be the first one to answer or certainly the first one to answer correctly. And uh, we'll give you a shout out on next week's show. Uh, but the other thing that we do on a weekly basis is also dive into the trivia question, not the trivia question, sorry, the questions that you leave us in the segments. This show is all about interaction and we want to get as many subscribers as we can, especially with Slammiversary coming up. Uh, we want to answer your questions. We want you to get involved. We don't want it all to be one way traffic where we're just putting it out, but we want to hear from you as well. So please do make sure that uh, you do leave us questions and thoughts on the show as well. If it's your first time stopping by, hit the subscribe button. Uh, uh, if you're listening on YouTube, if you're listening on any of the other ones, you know, like the, the podcast app on, I, on, on your iPhone, or on SoundCloud or whatever it may be on Podbean, then hit the subscribe and, and give us a review as well because uh, all feedback is good feedback. So thumbs up, thumbs down. Sound like Sammy Callahan. Uh, just make sure you do leave us something. Final thing I want to do this week is that I know Ro is busy on Twitter, those kind of things. I'm going to try and get back into it. I, I used to quite heavily, uh, you know, leave comments on Twitter and those kind of things. And if any of our listeners are listening to this, make sure you do follow, obviously, the Impact Lounge. But uh, Rose going to give you his Twitter handle in a second. Make sure you, you tap him up and give him a follow. But the one that I'm going to be uh, kind of reigniting and, you know, giving updates on news stories, those kind of things, is uh, V2 Wrestling Show. That used to be my moniker. So make sure that you do give us a... Uh, what's it like? Is, is it a, a follow? A follow, that's the word I'm looking for, on Twitter. Uh, and what's your one, Ro, for people to, to hit you up on? Yeah, you guys can hit me up at rtgreat underscore. Um, you know, I always give my thoughts on the Impact product, usually right after I watch Impact, and as well as uh, I give my thoughts on the ratings, you know. So, um, yeah, give me a follow. I love hearing your guys' thoughts and different opinions on what you guys think of impact on a weekly basis great so that's uh that's all the self-promotion we're going to do this week that's why we're in the wrestling business isn't it for self-promotion that's what makes this the number one place for impact reviews and news right okay so you did leave some questions for us last week i'm going to hand it over to ro because i'm still heavily jet lagged so he's going to be giving us these uh the questions that you left us last week and we'll give us your thoughts in a second so over to you ro okay this one's not much of a question it was more of a comment by rhs videos and he stated that the x division needs someone like a i'm assuming drew gulak Doug Williams, former X Division champion, 
and Adin Malenko. And if I'm not mistaken, I think what he's trying to say is have somebody more of the Matt, Matt technician like. And um, I had actually talked about this most recently on Twitter where I had shared a link for P. Williams was talking about the old X division saying how the old, uh, the new X division now doesn't compare to the old X division, which of course, you know, it's one of those old school, new school type of arguments. I'm of the mindset and I've been consistent with this in the past. I've always looked at the X division as a cruiserweight division. While you can look it back in its history, obviously you've had guys like a Samoa Joe or Abyss who don't f obviously fit the X Division mold, carry the title. But I always thought what they should do is mirror some of what WCW did with its cruiserweight division. Have a nice blend of cruiserweights where you have your high flyers, but you have your mat technicians, your strikers, and etc. There needs to be some diversity. You don't want to have everybody doing the same thing. So I think what RHS video is saying is kind of similar to what I had uh, thought myself that you know having the diversity so yeah i agree they should bring in a variety of guys or have a variety of guys competing in the division that way it's not just a whole bunch of high flyers i i can appreciate the submission specialists the mat technicians etc no no i i get what you're saying from there um and i, I completely agree that well i, I agree to this that they should have a bit more variety in there because it does sometimes feel like oh they're just going to go for some more flippy shit, as uh, I like to call it, you know, and set themselves up for another spot where they can all jump over the, the top rope or do or do some fancy move. Uh, and I think they have to get away from that because otherwise it does just become not character led, but just who can do the, the most death defying flip. And I, I certainly don't like that. And that's not why I used to like the X division. But I disagree with you on, on the on the weight class, you know, that. You get a guy like Brian Cage, and I know you want to see him away from the X Division, but why can't he be in the X Division? You know, he could do all the moves, all the, the cruiserweights can. So, you know, I, I don't think it does any harm at all. To go back to the point of, of you know, getting some more Matt, te Matt Technician, yeah, absolutely agree. The people that he mentioned, I don't know much about Drew Gulak, but certainly Dean Malenko and Doug Williams. I'm sorry, but I found those two not in ring te technically, but, but certainly from a character point of view very very bland uh but i get what he's saying but uh yeah i think if they're going to get a mactician matt technician it doesn't mean that they have to be boring or bland as well so so there you go um good good comment good point uh but yeah i, I think there does need to become you know get a bit more variety within the x division because it is becoming very very samey and when you see one 450 splash or 720 or whatever however many rotations they want to do you've seen them all and i know i'm saying that and then in the same breath a couple of weeks ago i was saying when here 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 i can't say it. hiroshimi does his moves they look like they hurt compared to some other people like johnny mundo um then i'll go back on what i'm saying there because um but but at the same time, you know, a flip is a flip. And after a while, you, you come, oh, yeah, he's doing another one. Oh, he's doing another one. So I, I do think there needs to be a change in there. Sorry, I rambled a bit there. You could tell that the jet lag's kicked in. All right, bro, what else you got for us? Yeah, and then the other question this week comes from Luke Avery. And he asks, if built right, could you see Tessa Blanchard being the next Gail Kim when you compare skill level and star power? You know, I hate to really compare i i understand what he's saying as far as maybe be the next face of the knockouts you think about gail kim you know her she was the heart and face of the knockouts division she kind of led the way when you think about it you know it remains to be seen really i mean she just uh tessa most recently just signed a long-term deal i think it runs for two years so we just have to see what she's able to do unfortunately and you know bq can allude to this as well you know she's been on the losing end a couple times in her short tenure with impact and obviously i don't think that's gonna be the case moving forward so uh, we just got to see what she can do i think she has a golden opportunity to be able to but we just have to wait and see uh my view on this is no I don't think she could be the next Gail Kim. And there's a very good reason for that, is that I think that she's already better than Gail Kim. 
wow, I know that you guys are going to absolutely slay me for that one. But um, Gail Kim was was awesome. I mean, she she was absolutely fantastic, you know. And her feuds with Terran and, and also Awesome Kong, incredible. But in all of her 10 years with Impact, in ring she was great. But as a character, she was she was never very good. And and I know I've, I've you know I've only been back ten minutes, and I'm talking about character all the time. But you know to be at the top of the game, you know you have to have not only great in ring ability, great in ring psychology, but you also have to have a great character. I mean I'd mentioned Dean Melenko five minutes ago. There he technically was one of the best in the ring but he was so bland you know he's not going to be remembered in the all-time greats but when you do think of the all-time greats you think of you know rick flair amazing on the mic amazing in the ring kurt angle amazing on the mic amazing in the ring even hulk hogan to some extent you know amazing on the mic and ring psychology not so great in the ring but you don't think of the you know your lance storms uh you know these people who are very very solid in the ring so for me, Tessa Blanchard has already got a better developed, better star power than Gail Kim ever had. And I think Gail Kim was great, you know, at changing up her style for the opponent that she was facing, you know, how she differed from Taryn to, to Awesome, those kind of things. But I think Tessa Blanchard can go bigger and better than, than Gail ever did. So, yeah, I know that's controversial, but, but let us know what you think of the thoughts below. Any comeback on that one, Ro? Um, I mean, I think the only thing, if you want, if I were to have a criticism of Gail Kim, I think she fell under the. <laughs> I had to use his reference, but she kind of got a, a Cena push, if I want to say, like where she kind of remained the same character once she really got the push and you know was the pretty much the face of the knockouts. Where I mean, I don't recall her putting over too many people. I mean. Maybe listeners, you guys can bring something up, but and and, and we'll get into this. But I had her, you know, really before seeing the uh, GWN flashback. Her her biggest feud that always came to mind was b- between her and Awesome Kong. I you know seeing the match that we saw with Taryn, you know, I had to remind myself like, oh dang, you know that she had a good feud with her as well. So. That would probably be my only thing. And I know even in her later years before she eventually retired, I mean, it's been said by some that she would hold the division hostage. And I kind of believe once you reach the top of the mountain and you've accomplished and achieved everything that you can, you know, you got to give back. So, you know, you ask yourself who really benefited from working with Gail Kim? Who did she put over? I mean, I guess you could say Taryn, you know, but Taryn's no longer with the company. Yeah, yeah. So I, I get your point. Uh, I, but I think once again, you know, when you look at back at your legacy, you can't look at someone who, you know, didn't have the opponents to go up against. And, you know, a good example of that would be someone like, you know, Magnus. Uh, who is NWA champion at the moment? You know, he had a long title reign there. Did he have any great opponents while he while he was champion? No, you know, but he had a long reign. Same with uh, Eli Drake. His first title run was it great? Not really, because the main focus was on Johnny Impact versus Alberto. You know, that was the main focus of the main event scene. It wasn't really about Eli Drake. So so you do have to have great opponents. And unfortunately for Gail, she did have two fantastic feuds, uh, which didn't happen only once, but you know, more than once with, with Awesome Kong and Taryn Terrell. I think Taryn Terrell, she had three feuds with. So, you know, it's, it's all about your opponent, the way that you handed yourself in the ring and, and, and those kind of things, you know. Uh, so, so yeah, um, it'll, be, it'll be good to see how Tessa gets on. But I think she has the ability to surpass Gail Kim, but she really needs a defining feud at the moment. This I think you know the Kira Hogan one could be could be one for the future. I mean, we, you've talked about it before. You know, you'd like to see it pick up later on down the line. We haven't seen Kiera f- since well f- for about four or five weeks now. So you know, I think somewhere down the line that could be one of her big feuds. The Madison Rain one, not really the Alley one, possibly. But you know, it really it will be interesting to see where she goes with it. So, um, any other questions, or is that it for the week? Was there anything else that stood out this week? Um, those were the two that really stood out to me. 
Great. Well, listeners, please do leave your comments below and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do our best to to get back into the regular routine of what we go go through each week uh, and answer your questions. So so do that in the comment section below and let's get a, a big build up to Slammiversary and let's see where we can go with this. Right. OK, uh, into this week's show then. So last week's was was largely regarded right across all the, the the wrestling media as one of the best shows impacts put out for a long time what do you think of this week's though uh, i'd have to say the same i mean back to back and it's just so funny because you know i find myself there's sometimes where it can be back to back weeks where i'm just like you know not really feeling it and then back to back weeks where it's just i mean it really just has me when once impact concludes where i'm like dang that was a, a great episode and this was no different than the last week. Just excellent stuff, top to bottom. It's funny because, you know, I saw a comment online talking about, you know, do they tape out of sequence? Because they, they were talking about someone in the front row of uh, the audience. You know, he was there all the way through the show, but he was wearing different clothes at different times, you know, suggesting that it was filmed on different nights. And, you know, obviously they don't film whole shows in one go. They chop and change it up to make up their shows. And I remember the first taping from uh, Windsor. I, it was the last show I did with you. There was there was a few people saying, well, it wasn't that great. You know, we we're expecting a better crowd reaction, all these kind of things. And I actually think they might have done that on purpose now, that they, they gave us not a poor episode on purpose, but they certainly gave – they knew that they had two – fantastic shows that they could put out and what they didn't want to do is to maybe dilute them a bit by having some great segments along with some not great segments and and i, I think maybe they've held back so they can put these two shows really really strong shows out in sequence for us uh because you know like yourself bro i, I thought this was a, this was a great episode yeah and you know what's so crazy and i'm not gonna dive too much into it but the ratings it was a just a 20,000 drop from last week's episode and it's just so weird you know how that stuff works because like i've stated there's been times where the show has just been you know you know something that is passable and you know the ratings will spike so i just hope it's something and i guess where where i guess a little bit of concern is you know the, there was a report out about a week or so ago that management had some concerns and if that's something that they're concerned the last thing you want them to do is kind of make a panic move and do something that takes away from what's been great television so uh yeah just i just always find it odd sometimes you know especially for some of these solid shows yeah it in the UK, it's slightly different. And I, I don't know what the ratings are like now, but certainly they used to be on a different channel. And it was a nothing channel. They just used to, you know, show reruns of game shows, which sounds awful. Uh, and, and it is. But that, that's where they used to be. And they used to get a bigger rating than Raw over here. So, and the reason being is that Raw was on a on a pay TV channel, uh, similar to how Pop is over there. It's not on your basic cable, uh, and Impact used to be on a free to air channel. So, I think they still get slightly better ratings than WWE over here, which is is quite surprising. But I wouldn't look too much into to TV ratings. You know, it really is a a medium of of the past. I think what is important for a broadcaster though is that if people are watching it on DVR, they may be not that interested in those figures and the reason being is obviously they pay for sponsors to advertise during the show and if people are watching on dvr they're most probably going to be fast forwarding past the adverts so it's very hard to sell to to potential sponsors so that's where it comes in but yeah i mean twenty thousand up or down doesn't really make that much of a difference but what i do find surprising about it is that when you do have a good show where you know the rating was 300 thousand last week you would think if they really enjoyed last week's show they would tune in this week as well but it, it doesn't seem to have any rhyme or reason as to to what goes on there right let's dive into the show shall we right okay so we opened up with a uh, recap of last week and what a show it was last week i'll tell you what i really enjoyed coming back to watch that show uh, I, I was in mexico for, t for two weeks as we said and it was quite funny in the first week that i was there they announced that they had got a tv deal 
over there for the Saturday night. And it was going to be airing for the first time in Mexico on my second week. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up, because this comes into ratings again, is that I watched the first episode of my, my first week of vacation on the GWN app, and it was up the next day. But I believe that with most of these TV deals that are, are put in place, that they can't show impact until 24 hours after the airing on terrestrial TV. So it was quite funny that the first week I got to see it on the GWN app, but because they then the second week I had a TV deal, they didn't post it up until after I left on the Mexican GWN app. So there you go. I didn't catch it until I get back. I hope that makes sense. Um, anyway, so great to see they are getting new TVDs around the world and, you know, it will help. But getting back into this show, uh, we started off with a recap really well done and then we went straight into the ogs versus oh, here's a question for you Ro. Do you know what the other team were called um no i don't <laughs> when i'm looking <laughs> at the results they said they call them dead meat and <laughs> at first i thought that was the actual name but then when i seen who they were facing i was like ah oh, i get it <laughs> yeah well it was funny because even josh matthews said uh, we didn't even actually get a chance to say their names but it was it was a guy called silver smith and lee so, um, yeah, I don't know who they were, but let's face it, this was just a, a squash match. What, what did you think of this? Because uh, although it was a squash match, you know, which obviously, uh, you know, it was kind of just to reintroduce them to the crowd. How, how did you think Hernandez and uh, Homicide looked in this? Well, first off, let me say this. I like how they were presented, that the fact that they went with the OG name and they gave them their own music and like you said, this was used as a tool to reintroduce the crowd to these guys. For those of you, uh, excuse me, for those of the fans who weren't familiar with their tenure during the time of when they were in LAX. Um, so it was just made to just make them look somewhat credible as they look towards challenging LAX at Slammiversary. Now, I don't know if it's going to, if the titles were on the line, I'd assume, but you know, the one thing, the one criticism, well, I don't, I'm not going to even say criticism because I mean, it's father time, but it's just, man, I just look at Hernandez and, you know, like I said, you know, with father time, obviously, but you know, you think about, you know, when he was in his prime, I mean, he just really looks old and, you know, I, I wanted to see him deliver the border toss because that used to be one of my favorite moves as well as the gringo killer and you know when he delivers that move sometime i mean i always fear for the person taking it it just looks like it's so um careless you know how he just throws them but obviously you know these are professionals so they know how to take moves and whatnot yeah so just on that you know i i know you're saying that he, he looks at older which obviously he is but i actually thought he looked quite good in the ring and, and you know the border toss was, was done very well but um yeah this match was just there really to set up the after you know match promo which i thought was excellent king has been killing it on the mic uh, i know there was no glory hole chant this week but uh he has been ki killing it on the mic and and i thought he was great and you know he talked about how he had to stay two steps ahead I don't know how you say two steps ahead. I always thought it was one step ahead, but well done him, you know. Um, and that they were they weren't interested in the tag titles. Now I thought this was interesting because this suggests to me that it's not a tag title match at Slammiversary, which I just don't get. You know, it seemed a very specific thing to say and then announce that you're having a match at Slammiversary against the tag champs, which makes me think they they're either going to win it, but they don't want to put the tag titles on them. But to me, it just stood out like a sore thumb. You know, I and you know, I didn't even catch that part of it. I mean, it would make sense. I mean, you look at Slammiversary. This is, you know, one of I call this their uh, their flagship event. I know, obviously, Bound for Glory is more of the one that's their. I guess you would say their WrestleMania, so to speak. And I guess Slammiverse would be their SummerSlam. But I, for the tag titles not to be on the line, is just kind of odd. But, you know, once again, I'm going to say, man, King's work since coming back to Impact, man, you know, I'm glad this this regime has found a, a place for him. He's just been excellent. And I don't know moving forward if we're going to see him in a wrestling role or in a or is he going to remain a manager role or whatever the case may be. But I just really like they found a place for him and how they've been using him. 
No, absolutely. I, it, it's it's brilliant that they brought him back because he, he was a guy that has been criminally underused. Uh, the only time you ever really saw him was when, I think it was in the last Bound for Gold, he, he had a random entry in it, uh, not as part of the DCC, just as Eddie Kingston. And, you know, he didn't last that long. But anyway, no, going, going back to, I, I do want to talk about this and I'd like to get our listeners' views on this because I, I do want to touch on the Slammiversary match and the fact that it's non-tag title. The, the fact that they've highlighted this, to me, suggests that there can only be one result, which is that the OGs are going to win. Because, uh, But at the same time, why... <laughs> I'm just thinking about the chain of events to where we got here. Eddie came back, led LAX to get the tag titles back because he said that was the most important thing. It wasn't about... It was to get them on a winning streak and to get the tag titles back so they can make the paper or whatever they wanted to describe it. But now he brings the OGs back because the other guys, that their time is over. But he doesn't want the tag titles, which along with it brings the paper. But it doesn't make sense. And by the fact that they threw that in there, that it's not for the tag titles, just says to me that surely they're going to win their match. Uh, because they don't want to put the tag titles on them, but they want this feud to continue, which I'm fine with. But why put the tag titles on NAX only a couple of weeks ago when you could have had the same storyline where they started just on a winning streak without winning the titles back, you know, and then had a title match at at uh, Slammiversary, you know, have Falabar and, and KM challenge Z&E or even have, you know, OV or whoever it may be. But with this way, it, to me, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's, it's weird. Um, you know, like I said, I credit them for finding LAX something to do just because you know we've seen anytime they get the championships you know they get stale relatively quick but yeah it just it, a lot of stuff doesn't add up I even said I like, wouldn't have made more sense for Conan to align with Homicide and Hernandez given the history and you have King assi uh, align with Santana and Ortiz but I mean I guess you know the angle you could run is homicide and you know probably felt that you know conan betrayed him or however they want to play it but yeah it just doesn't make any sense for the titles not to be on the line i mean i'm of the mindset that the ogs this is probably just a, a one-off appearance so you know and i know there will probably be given uh our uh predictions sometime this week so i mean i would assume lax would win i mean stranger things have happened obviously so, but yeah, the fact that the titles aren't on the line, that's, that's kind of weird to me. Yeah, I think it'd be too quick to cut this storyline off, you know, with, with Eddie and, and uh, the returning OGs. So I, I can only see the OGs winning it, uh, unlike yourself. The one thing I'm worried about, and you know, I'm, I'm very high. <laughs> I, 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 maybe I should change that terminology. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very pro LAX, you know, saying that I think that they're an amazing tag team. I don't want them to go OVE on us in that get forget in this feud because everyone seems to be getting mic time except for LAX at the moment, as in, you know, uh, Santana and Ortiz. They're the only two who don't seem to be getting any mic time. They did in the build up when it was with King, but at the moment they seem to be lost in the background. And uh, these two kids, kids, I kind of I call them that, these two guys really need to. Uh, be at the forefront of this because they are so so good but anyway there we go let's move on so then we had uh, the mango who was ready to tango Shotzi Blackheart in a backstage interview with Ali I, I love this I mean this girl's nuts but I love this yeah I'm all for new additions I don't know um I remember reading about her appearing I don't know what her contract status is I will say this and this isn't to speculate anything and I spoke to BQ about this too offline and I'm not trying to be negative, but you got to know, you know, with them re-signing Eli and signing Tessa to a long-term deal, some of these people that are being brought on board that they are signing, you do know for somebody to come in, that's somebody who's departing. And, you know, I know for some, we all have our phase that we don't want to see go, but I think, I don't know if it was the teleconference or on Talk is Jericho, but where Don had mentioned, you know, he's a fan of refreshing the roster from time to time having the core six people and then the rest of the roster just you know you kind of cycle in and out wrestlers so that's something to look out for but as far as for Shotzi Blackheart um I don't know much about her I do like that it seems like she's 
different from the other knockouts. And once again, like we had talked about earlier with the X division, same thing applies for the knockouts. What you have to have is diversity. You can't have the same type of, um, I guess when you're explaining with knockouts, you know, same super attractive, you know, fighter, or whatever. You know, you want to have a nice blend. And I think the Shotzi Blackheart is somebody that can uh, add to that diversity. <laughs> Just on your comment about, you know, maybe someone's going to be released from the roster, uh, who would be your prediction? And, and the same to the listeners who are out there today. Let us know who you think, uh, if Roe is right, if, if they are signing these new guys, well, if they're signing Tessa and, and Eli, who's for the chop from the current roster? We haven't seen DJ Z and uh, Everett since uh, losing the titles. Maybe it could be them. Right. Any ideas, Roe? Who would you go for? I mean, I wouldn't who even... Would... I, I don't even know. I mean, you sit back and... I mean, you can look at people who are on the shelf. I mean, it's just kind of, I would have to see how these new tapings are. And then uh, I'll go a step further at Slammiversary to see who's not on the card. Um, I, I Look, if I was going to go out on a limb, and this is probably, I'm probably just really going on a big limb. It wouldn't surprise me if maybe somebody like a Trevor Lee, they, you know, they, he decides to part ways with the company. You know, and I mean, I know it probably doesn't make any sense, but, you know, he seems like a guy you, we seen him a couple of weeks ago facing Swan and on the losing end, which I mean, obviously doesn't hurt him or anything like that. But, you know, he might be a guy gets lost in the shuffle. So, I mean, I don't really have anybody clear cut. I'd have to probably sit back and really, really think about it. So I'm going to be looking forward to seeing who some of the listeners think that might be somebody that might depart the company but that's just me just going out on a limb fair enough let, let us know in the comments below all right just back to to Shotzi uh, about signing uh, a deal with impact it was announced this week she just she's just broken her ankle uh, at a show so uh, you know she might be featured again at these tapings but she's not going to be a slam anniversary certainly not a wrestling capacity and i doubt she's going to be making the the next tapings either so although i thought it was a great debut uh, I, I don't think we're going to see her around certainly in the short term uh, but j just going back to the debut i thought she wrestled really well and and the great i tell you what's the hardest thing in pro wrestling is to make a debut and to actually have a fully developed character and someone who's someone is going to remember and for me she did all of those things you know she seems to have her, her character down she has a really interesting look she was good in the ring and i'm going to remember this you know i i didn't think for a second she was going to beat ali but at the same time i just thought it was a really competent debut and i'd like to see more from her yeah i agree um i think the presentation i mean obviously there was no doubt in my mind that ali wasn't going to come out victorious but like i said you know, it was different from the knockouts that we already have. So, you know, that's unfortunate about her ankle. But, you know, like I said, it may be if she, if she is signed, um, nice addition to the roster. Yeah, absolutely. And and one thing, you know, people always say about how great Ali is. I actually thought Shotzi looks better in the ring. And, I, and I'm quite down on Ali quite, you know, often about her wrestling ability. But, you know, let's not forget Ali has been a veteran for however long it is, 14 plus years. And to me, sometimes she still looks green in the ring, whereas I thought Shotzi was very good. Another comment I just want to make is I think they did the right thing in bringing Shotzi in at the Windsor tapings because, you know, she's very much a crowd interactor in the way she howls and screams and uh, and is, is talking throughout the match. And if they'd have done this in the impact zone, it would have seemed strange, you know, with the crickets going on. So, you know, great debut. Hopefully we will see her again. And hopefully this isn't just a, a one and done deal. Now, just with regard to the end of the match, obviously we had Tessa come back in uh, and once again, I thought she looked like a million bucks. You know, I love the way that her out of ring attire differs to how she, what she wears in the ring. You know, the, the blue trainers, the black leggings, those kind of things. She looks great. Every time she runs into the ring and does something, you know, she just has got that it factor. Yeah. And you know, this is going to be her big feud since, I mean, I guess signing the long-term deal. So, and I think Allie would be, is a good, um, I don't want to even say stepping stone, but it's a good person for her to work with as she tries to propel in the knockouts division. Mm. The, the Allie-Tessa 
feud. I mean, it's kind of not come out of nowhere because obviously it started last week. But at the same time, uh, what uh, Ali seems to have fallen from grace very quickly here. You know, when you think about her character development, it took two years or however long it was for her to go from being uh, Saxton. What's his name? Saxton Byron? No, I can't think of his name. Bra- Bra- uh... Brett Braxton Braxton Sutton. (laughs) I can think of his name. Uh, You know, being involved in a love triangle with him, the whole build up, you know, against Laurel Van Ness until she finally got that feel good moment uh, against Laurel. And, but she felt, it felt like she was champion for, for just two minutes. And then she lost it to Sue Young. And now she's not really feuding with Sue Young anymore. She's going to be feuding with Tessa. Can you really see Tessa losing this feud now that she signed a long term contract? It just seems like, a very slow build to get Ali to that top baby face section. And now it looks like she's not being buried. You know, that could be the one who leaves that we were talking about earlier on. You never know. Uh, the way, that, you know, with uh, Braxton gone, you never know. Ali might be the next one. There you go. There's my prediction. Yeah, um, you, you know, and if I could just add one thing, I thought where they kind of missed the boat, they could have gotten more mileage out of her and the Sue Young feud. I was of the mindset, and I know Impact doesn't really honor the rematch clauses, and that's fine. But I really thought that they could have got more out of that because essentially they pretty much just had, what, can, is it safe to say two matches? I, I, they might have had a tag match. But, you know, you have the match at Redemption, and then um, I forgot what was the special event they had. I want to say, was it Under Pressure or? No Surrender? Was it? No Surrender, I think. Okay, all right. My- oh, no, no, it was, it was under pressure. You know, you're absolutely right. It was under pressure, pressure. And then she drops the title to her, and she gets buried, and then that's it. She comes back, you know, for the, to save Madison Rain, but ends up feuding with Tessa. So I, I just kind of think that was one of the things where they could have got more mileage out of that. And, yeah, I agree. I think they took too long to really give – Ali the payoff and I don't think it was any any of her fault obviously I think with you think about two years ago all the changes the company was going through and I mean her her uh, character was too much stop and go but yeah it, and you know now that you mentioned it too she could be somebody that's uh, on her way out but I'm of the mindset that we, we might see Braxton Sutter coming back not that I have any type of uh, source or anything I'm just guessing. I, I think probably at the time they didn't have anything for him, but I could see a scenario where they bring him back. I, I thought he was great in his last uh, couple of months with, with Impact. Uh, they were finally giving him something to do, proposing to everyone, but uh, at least there was something he was doing, and he's been seen a bit of a joke, but I, I, I quite liked his character and where it was going. Um, just uh, So, yeah, so Tessa cut this uh, backstage promo as well. Uh, I, I was, maybe I'm jumping ahead of myself here. But... Um, yeah, the, the, the Sue Young thing is, is really harmed Ali because she got literally buried and figuratively buried from this feud. And I don't know if it's because they want to do something with Rosemary further down the line and Rosemary's injured. I, I, I don't know. But, you know, we've also got this other person who's going to be debuting, you know, this this mystery segment that keeps on happening. So, you know, there's going to be more knockouts joining again. And you just think are we going to be lost in the shuffle here? And if BQ's been saying about, you know, Rise maybe potentially going out of business and those kind of things, you know, there's going to be a lot more knockouts on the scene as well, you know, that that they could potentially sign. So going back to your comment, if they did release Ali, do you think that would be a big loss? No, because I think we're at a point, and I, I want to say too, before I really get into this, I'm glad that they felt, that Eli Drake was important enough to the company to resign him because I think the company's at a point where they probably look at it as there's not one wrestler that's irreplaceable. So, I mean, I guess when you can look at it, all the stuff they put into Ali and, you know, she became a top babyface in the knockouts division. But I think you could easily fill that role to anyone else. And that, and that's not a knock on Ali because I, I like Ali. I just, I hate that they took as long as they did to really give her that push, let alone give her her second knockouts uh, title reign. But I, I think the company will be all right. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't disagree with any of that. Um, I, you know, I, I think a character development was very, very slow. I don't mind that, but I, I think her 
her character development with regards to wrestling ability has been very slow. I mean, I, I read all the time online that, you know, apparently she's amazing in the ring, but they just don't let her do it because of the character. And and to me, I, I can't believe that after all this time because she still doesn't look great in the ring. You know, if you said to me at the next set of tapings, Laura Van Ness could come back and we'd lose Ali, I would take that deal in a second. People people always used to say that Laura Van Ness wasn't great in the ring. I think she was fantastic. And she was another person who, who I preferred over Ali. But, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see. And, and, and an example of this, by the way, is that when Tessa jumped uh, Ali and hit the, was it the Hammerlock DDT? Is that what they're calling it? She didn't sell it very well. It was, and it wasn't Tessa's fault. It was Ali. She just didn't seem to take the move. Where you look at Kiara Hogan, when she took it, every time she took it, it looked like a devastating move. Whereas when Ali took it, it just like, oh, well, that didn't really connect properly. So yeah, that's something to go back and look for. You know, when you look at the, the two way those two took the move, um, it was like Ali said, well, okay, you're going to hit it on me, but I'm not going to make it look good. So anyway, uh, we've talked enough about uh, the knockouts and I, I think that they've done, well, it's Gail Kim, isn't it, who's been booking them. Uh, so I think they've done a, a very, very good job recently of, of where they're going with these things and, you know, bringing in new people. And, and, and you think back to 12 months ago, the knockout roster that they had when Gail Kim was still involved, Taron was in there, all these kind of people. And even two years ago where you had the dollhouse, et cetera. And I think that it's in a better state now than it's, that it's been in a long, long time. You haven't got the old hands other than Madison rain kicking about. Um, you know, you haven't got your ODBs, your beautiful people, your velvet skies. Uh, you've actually got a really fresh young roster there. and it, It's amazing. So um, next we had Grado backstage with Katerina, Joe Henry and Eli Drake. Uh, this was quite good. And, and Eli shows his worth once again. He's just such a natural, isn't he? Anytime you put him in front of the camera. Yeah. Um, I'm interested to see what direction they have with him now that he's re-signed. I'd like to believe that he's going to be integrated back into the main event scene. This did have me thinking, man. And <laughs> I hate to just keep be, uh, bringing up old uh, past topics. But man, I really wish they had a mid-card a championship like if they were to decide to do like a tv title and put it on someone like eli since he's a big name that could really uh get the title off the ground because you know right now you look at the main event seat i know we're, we're having uh austin aries and moose but then after that you know soon whenever they decide to culminate that feud you know you wonder what's next and i mean i guess you know they could go the hill versus hill route but yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad to see him back. I'm glad that they he was on because I I feared that he wasn't on these tapings. And let me ask you before you talk about this: Do you think we'll be seeing him at Slammiversary in some shape or form? I, I think we will, but I've got a feeling it's going to be a bit of a nothing match because the the way this feud looks like it's going is that this was solely there to start sowing the seeds of doubt between Grado and Joe. Uh, it doesn't feel like Eli should have been in this. You know, he's just been inserted into it just so that Katerina looks like she's going to be with Joe. Because that's the way the commentary team were pushing it. And that's the way that Eli sold it at the end, you know, that, oh, she's not really interested in Grady. She's interested in Joe. So um, it could very well be that we got a Joe Henry versus Eli Drake at, at the pay-per-view. I think it's more likely it's going to be Joe Henry versus Grado at the pay-per-view. So what they do with Eli, ooh, I don't know. I don't know. But the thing is, at this point, he hadn't signed a new contract, so they didn't want to do anything with him. So I can understand why. I, I don't think it's a slight on, on Eli or a slight on Impact or the creative team. I just think they were hedging their bets at this stage. Yeah, I agree. And you know what? Credit to Impact, because you think about the old regime, they might have kind of bent over backwards to you know pander to talent only to get screwed over by talent. And they stood firm like, hey, look, you know, if you decide to sign this contract, hey, we got plans for you. But if you're up in the air, then, hey, we're going to just kind of keep you on the fence till we kind of get some uh, commitment from your side. So kudos to them. Yep. I think they're managing the roster very, very well at the moment. <clears throat> okay, so we did have a Tessa backstage going on about Madison Rain. We won't dwell on that because we've talked about the knockouts for, for long enough. Um, but then we did have the airing of the video for the upcoming knockout debut. And I know you guys have been speculating that it was going to be Scarlett Bordeaux. I don't know anything about this woman, but uh, judging by this, this coming soon, uh, it, she looks fine. 
that's all I can say on that. Uh, anything to add? You know, I wonder if she's going to come in as a valet. I think that's one thing, too, that's been been missing. And I think wrestling as a whole, I know, or at least an impact, you know, you don't have too many managers. I kind of miss when you can bring somebody in and have them accompany someone else for the time being before you have them break apart and compete. Um, as far as if she's the rumored person, I don't know too much about her. Um, Impact's history, hiring knockouts. I mean, <laughs> I mean, they got good taste. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> but you're saying about the valet bit. But who would you like to see uh, coming in with? Because obviously we've got Katarina, who's done something similar with Joe Henry and, and Grado. But is there anyone that you can think of that needs a mouthpiece like that? Uh, you know, once again, that's one of those things I'd probably have to sit back and think. I mean, you know, if there's somebody that they wanted to debut or somebody that they wanted to repackage, maybe you could do that. But then once again, you know, who would be the person, you know, um, I mean, because I, I guess I would just say default Eli, but Eli doesn't need that because Eli can speak on his own. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I think you could just use it as a way if you wanted to debut a new wrestler. But yeah, I, I can't think of anyone right now on the current roster that needs a, a mouthpiece. Anyway, all the rumors are wrong. Anyway, it's going to be Tito Ortiz. Um, there you go. <laughs> That's my guess. <laughs> there's, there's my running gag for you. Right. Um, okay. So then we had Austin Aries cut a, a backstage promo on Moose. Let's just leave this one for the time being, because obviously we're going to be looking at um, the, the in-ring segment with uh, D'Angelo in a little while. So let's skip past that, uh, unless you've got anything you wanted to say about the promo. Oh, no, just... Uh, same stuff from Austin Aries. I mean, they're really selling this match to be a big deal. And this is one of the many matches that I'm looking forward to at the pay-per-view. Now, next we had the GWN flashback. And this is a great match that they showed, Taron versus Gale in the last knockout standing. I thought this was a fantastic one. It's one of the few that I've gone back and watched. Yeah, you know, like I was stating earlier, I every time when I have thought about Gail Kim in T and well during the time TNA, I had always thought her feud with Awesome Kong, and seeing this reminded me like you know she had a a great rivalry with Taryn Terrell. Now in this match, because I only seen what they showed on the GWN uh, flashback, was Gail Kim the heel in this, or I mean I, I was kind of confused, or was Taryn the heel? Yeah, T Taryn was was a face all the way through until she joined the the dollhouse out of the blue. So so at this point, I'm I'm 99 sure that Taryn was still the face in this. So Gail would have been the heel. Yeah, absolutely. See, and you know, I was in. I try to recall because I I want to say the only time Gail Kim was heel during her in TNA was her early run when her first when she first was with the company. I think she had aligned with. Uh, America's Most Wanted, but once she broke off and, you know, done did the thing with the knockouts, she had been a face, you know, for the remainder of her time. So that's why when I, when I was uh, watching this and, you know, just seeing some of the her mannerisms, I was like, you know, kind of when did this happen? But yeah, this was an excellent match. Um, one of the underrated feuds, this was, a, you know, they had a great feud and, and you know, I kind of thank them for refreshing my memory on this. Yeah, so I'm just trying to look it up as we speak, but uh, my fingers are like fat sausages after two weeks of inc all inclusive, so I can't type it up and do two things at one time. But yeah, I I'm fairly sure this was before the dollhouse because I'm sure the dollhouse came about after she turned on Awesome Kong. So I I'm, I'm fairly certain that this that Tyron would have been uh, a face at this point. And and this feud was fantastic. As I said, they had two or three. They had a ladder match from memory as well, um, which was great. And the third one, which was when she came back last time. Well, I don't know if we ever got the third match in, in actual fact, but I think back to it. I think it was supposed to happen at Bound for Glory, but then it never did because obviously uh, Tyron left again. But anyway, um, yeah, one of the few GWN moments, which I thought was excellent. Um, so... Then we had, as I said, we had the D'Angelo segment with Austin Aries. And I, I thought this was really, really well done. And I, and I love Austin Aries' character at the moment. I, I love the way that he keeps on bringing up the fact that um, Moose is a loser. And and he also said about D'Angelo being a loser. I, I really quite enjoyed this. Uh, heel Austin Aries is so much better than face Austin Aries. Yes, 
Man, I was laughing so hard. I think that the moment that got me, he said he had brought up the Super Bowl, and he told D'Angelo Williams, like, wait a minute, you never won one. Neither did Moose. Like, he was, he was finding everything that him and Moose had in common, you know, bringing up shortcomings. And I thought it was hilarious. And I it seems like, uh, and I don't know, I don't know how accurate it is, but I think D'Angelo Williams has signed a contract with Impact Wrestling. I'm, I'm not sure. But I thought that was awesome that he took that mic shot and then the low blow. Because, you know, a lot of times when we kind of get these uh, athletes, or I guess in his case he's a former athlete or celebrities, they're, they take limited moves, obviously. And I, it looks like for him, he's going to commit to being a wrestler full time. So I think this gives Impact an opportunity to have you know another homegrown guy underneath their umbrella i will say this there is a little bit concern i'm hoping i'm just hoping i don't want him to be the deciding factor of the match between moose and austin aries i really want to see what they can do just for the simple fact i want to see if moose can handle a, a main event push like he's uh been getting right now at this moment and i don't want uh, D'Angelo Williams to be the deciding factor now the moment I say that chances are he might interfere and cost one of them you know remains to be seen obviously but yeah that that's I guess that's just my concern and, and if he does interfere in the main event who's he going to turn on is it going to be Austin Aries is he going to stick up for Moose or do you think he'll turn on Moose see it's 50 50 because if we go by traditional wrestling Usually the person who's accompanying the face ends up siding with the heel. But, I mean, I, I yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I could easily see a way where he helps Moose capture hit the Impact World Championship. But I, it, it's, uh, it's up in the air, man. <laughs> I mean, we always talk about, you know, so-and-so should be heel, so-and-so should be heel. But D'Angelo has got that baby face kind of look and vibe about him hasn't he so um yeah it'll be interesting to see what happens but yeah i, I just austin aries a double just he knows how to work, work a crowd doesn't he as a heel i mean even the way he went thank you but i know my name when they were chanting his name you know that that's that's just great you know and it, and it, there's only a few guys on the roster who, who seem to have that ability you know i always thought that james storm you know he could literally have two people in the crowd and he'd be able to get them chanting you know he was such a consummate professional even bully ray you know i, I don't like bully bully ray at all as, as a person you know f from the, you know the moves that he's done you know in politics outside of the ring but in the ring he was one of the best promoers, not because of his passion, but just the way he can work a crowd. And and, and that there's so many people you know, like Johnny Impact doesn't have it. You know, Moose doesn't have it. But 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 Austin Aries is is, is a, a bona fide superstar on the mic. I shouldn't use the word superstar. That makes us think of sports entertainment. Anyway, uh, yeah, I like the segment. Uh, I even like the fact that Aries, you know, hit D'Angelo with, with the chair. You know, it was good that D'Angelo took the shots. It's a fair play to him. Uh, hopefully we will see him back in a ring because he, he is excellent. He, I, I was there at Slammiversary for that first match he did. Well, the only match he's done. And except for the bit where he overshot the, um, the body splash through the table, he looked like an absolute veteran of the ring. Yeah, um, it's going to be interesting. I think he might, I could even see him being starting off in the X Division, which would be neat. Yeah, going back to that, that diversity part of it, you know, of getting someone who, who could do something different as opposed to just, you know, uh, a, uh, <laughs> a 1080 splash. I don't know if that's, I don't know <laughs> if that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm copywriting that one. All right, okay. Um, next up, Eli Drake versus Grado. And I quite like what they're doing with, with this storyline, except for the fact that, you know, Eli doesn't really have much place in it. He's just being thrown in there randomly. But I quite like the confidence that Grado has about him, those kind of things. And um, although, well, it, it wasn't really a squash match because, you know, Grado got some uh, some offense in at the beginning. It, it didn't last very long, let's face it. My favorite part of Grado's matches is the commentary that Don provides. I mean, man, he just goes all in on Grado. It's so hilarious. I mean, I don't know if you catch this stuff, 
but just the jabs that he takes that he takes at uh, <laughs> Grado, it's it's funny. Um, you know, obviously this match was just you know kind of to I don't even want to say reestablish Eli Drake, but to, to give Eli Drake a convincing win, and you know to kind of plant the seeds to eventual and inevitable breakup between Grado and Katarina with uh, Joe Hendry's uh, uh, arrival, obviously. So, yeah, um, in credit to Grado for hitting that Rana. I didn't know he had it in him. Talking of uh, hitting a Rana, what about the one from <laughs> not Awesome Kong? Um, oh, I can't think of his name. Um, Congo Kong last week. That was that was incredible on Brian Cage. Anyway, uh, we're not going to go back to last week's show. But yeah, go, going back to this one, Don Callis. Do you know how good this guy is? He makes you not hate Josh on commentary. That's how good this guy is. He gets you to forget that nobody likes Josh Matthews. He's so good. His, his, his jibes are just, it seems so natural to him. And, and, you know, we talked about it before about the commentary team and, you know, Don West was our favorite. Don Callis is slowly becoming my favorite commentator of all time. He really is that good. Yes, I'm I'm glad they were able to get him to do commentary because I know originally when he was coming on board, that was one of the things, you know, we had thought that that wasn't going to be the case because we had Sanjay, which I had no problem with Sanjay, but Don, I mean, <laughs> just because he kind of plays a de facto heel announcer and uh, it's just it's some of the matches, just some of the stuff he says, man, it just has me just rolling, rolling off my chair. I mean, he really is up there with with the greats. You know, your Bobbies, your your, your monsoons, your your Jesse Ventura's. Not monsoon because he was more play by play, but um, you know, he's really that good. So yeah, fantastic. And I'm glad that he's part of the management. Otherwise, you know, he's the kind of guy that you can imagine that, that WWE might try and come and get. Anyway, uh, Killer Cross does an intense interview next. This was amazing. Killer Cross just looks fantastic, doesn't he? I mean, the way they debuted him. Awesome. The way that, you know, he was the cop where he had to go at P.T. Williams. That was, the you know, his first segment. Amazing. Last week's match with Falabar, you know, the match itself was, was OK. But just his the whole way he's been presented, they've done a fantastic job of debuting this guy. Yeah, we forgot to mention before we get into that, they had the backstage promo where they were talking about uh, KM was apologizing to follow about his match with Killer Cross, and they were interrupted by the Desi Hit Squad. Uh, you know, just a brief interaction. But yeah, I was. Big I actually, on actually, the- let's let's talk about that. Sorry, I, I'm reading this from spoilers because I did watch the show, but I forgot that bit happened, and I, I don't want to miss that. Because when I was watching the show, I did think I want to talk about this for various reasons. So, um, what, what did you think of that segment, by the way? Before we get back to Killer Cross, I mean, I like the fact with the Desi Hit Squad now because it's the second week in a row we get some type of backstage segment with them because I think after talking about them and the only thing we've seen from them before their arrival was just Rohit Raju essentially just jobbing left and right or appearing on explosion you know this is giving them an opportunity to really get us to know who the Desi Hit Squad is and now you know you look at the tag team division we were only talking about this a couple months ago about how thin it was and now you know once again you know it's it's a solid all around you know you got a bunch of bunch of teams now well I don't want to say a bunch but you got enough to make it respectable so yeah I just want to talk about Desi Hit Squad I mean you know I love Falaba and KM you know two of my favorite characters on the show and i'm glad that they haven't split them up but they've kept them together somehow although it didn't look possible but it, i don't know if maybe they've kind of backtracked and thought actually do you know what we've got nothing else for these guys let's let's keep them together let's not have that feud um so i'm glad that they have but desi hit squad to me this this gimmick is dead on arrival it really is uh, i mean and it's not rohit ranju's fault it's not sorry i don't even know the other guy's name you know in ring they looked all right, they didn't look amazing, but at least that they're a team. The biggest problem is, is it Gamet? Is that his name? Um, Gamet Singh? Um, yeah, it, it's him. You know, that he's got this, apparently this this legacy or this, he's he's one of the greats. I, I've, I don't even know the guy, you know, other than the fact that we kept on being told that this guy's a legend. I, I don't know the guy. 
but he cuts a horrible promo. He really does. And and I just think this whole thing has just been so badly debuted. You know, I was just about to say about Killer Cross being fantastically debuted. The, the, the Desi Hit Squad is just awful. It is terrible. It's one of the – they're one of the, the worst – tag team debuts that i can remember in a long time and it, it's not by the way this is not me you know having anything against india or anything like that because you know i think that there's absolutely a, a, a place for this team but gamut singh has just drawn all the energy all of the all of the potential impact out of this by someone who's supposedly a legend that we keep on being told but he's actually detracted from them in, in my opinion and and they just don't look very good Tell us how you really feel, Adam. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I'm on the fence is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, I, I think with them, and just like we had mentioned with Ali and, you know, anybody, I think sometimes with some of these debuts, they take too long. So then when you finally get the debut or the payoff, whatever, it it just doesn't it doesn't uh, resonate like, like it would. That's why I had thought, you know, with with – the, you know them announcing it they probably should have waited till they were ready to uh debut them before they had you know hakeem zane change his name to rohit raju and align with it and then you have him jobbing out left and right then all of a sudden yeah he's part of this group so yeah you know it, it is a bit of mishandling on their end but i have faith in they'll be able to right the wrong i i mean i have to disagree with you i uh like them and interested to see what they do moving forward I mean, to me, it, it looks almost like he's Mr. Fuji, you know, and that he interferes in matches and that's how they're going to win. Uh, but the problem is they're letting him talk on camera and, and, and it's just hopeless. It's it, To me, it's killing the, the, the tag team before it even starts, you know. But anyway, we'll see where they go with it. Anyway, back to Killer Cross, something I did in, well, I make it out like I did enjoy the show. That's, that's about the first negative I come up with. But the Killer Cross stuff was amazing. I, th I think how they've presented him has just been excellent i mean they really made him look like a badass and you know i kind of i i kind of hate that we're gonna get this match between him and pete williams next week i would have loved to see this at the pay-per-view i think you know somebody of his caliber or the way that they've portrayed him thus far you know to have him on pay-per-view and you know to have him just tearing apart pete williams would have been phenomenal but yeah the presentation of him and i like i said him using that choke that really just makes him look more of a badass yeah i, th I think you're right what they what i think they should have possibly done i don't think they should have fed him falabar in the first week i think they possibly should have had him in against a, a job of the first one um or even had him in against you know the likes of the two that uh the ogs took out you know have him in a handicap match kind of thing or, or even brought back it was his name lord fernham you know the, the guys that ec3 used to beat up every week you know it would have been fun to have them back and then have maybe fella bark standing up for them and then pt williams building up to it but yeah it does seem to have happened very very quickly because you know if this match happens next week where do you put killer cross on the pay-per-view you know you want him to have something meaningful and can you really build anything meaningful unless he has a, a handicap match against pt williams and and someone else you know i, I don't know but uh, i do love his catchphrase um everybody pays the toll uh, I, I think that's a great catchphrase uh, i'll be interested to see what t-shirt he's got i wouldn't mind uh, he, uh he's the kind of guy who i imagine is gonna have a pretty cool t-shirt yeah he released one it shows it's that um remember the logo that yeah the x symbol yeah so i know i might i might have to get one get one too anyway so uh yeah well done on, on the killer cross thing his promos are great and just the way he's been presented is fantastic as you say it's a shame that he's facing pt next week what i'd imagine is that there's going to be a bunch of interference and then i'll have the rematch of the pay-per-view uh, i'd guess right so then we went to another backstage segment when was the last time we had a wrestling match i can't remember uh matt seidel interviewed backstage uh, once again, I, I like what they've done with Matt. You know, same with Eddie Edwards, where they they turned a fairly one-dimensional person into someone who you care about, and you know, not care about, but certainly who's someone who you dislike and have feelings towards. So, yeah, it's good. Namaste. Over to you. Yeah, you know what? I don't know what to think think about this leading up to their match because I mean, I already know w what I think might happen, but. I could see it going a different way. So it's going to be interesting to see. And 
you know, I wondered, and let me let me ask you, do you think that alliance between Matt Seidel and with Jimmy Jacobs and Kong, Kong, uh, excuse me, Congo Kong was a one-off? Or you, you just think for this particular promo, they didn't really want to have them in the background? Um, I, I do think it was a one-off. I, I think it was, you know, as in a random entry into the, the feud, which I don't think was you know, uh, started by Seidel in the storyline mode. I think it was something that Jimmy Jacobs took upon himself as opposed to Matt Seidel asking for the help. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I missed something on, on the other shows. So no, I think it was a, it was a one-off and yeah, you know, it'd be interesting to see once again, if they interfere in the match at the pay-per-view, because as far as I know, I can't see Kong on, on the card at the moment. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, I think it was a one-off, although once again, he might get re-entered into it. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know how they're going to, to book this, but I actually just want to see Seidel win. I want to see him carry on with the X Division. I think he's he's been very, very good at it. And I, and I just think that, that Cage can have an interesting feud with anyone. He doesn't need a belt at this point. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly with, with regards to the belts on offer, there's only really two that you can go for. Uh, and that's obviously the X Division or the World Championship. So with that in mind, I don't think he needs the belt. If there's a mid-card belt, I think he could feud with someone like Eli Drake over it. But yeah, um, it'll be interesting to see where they go with this. Yeah, and you know, it had me thinking too. Um, when you think about Once Upon a Time when Bischoff went over to the E and he did away with all the titles where he only kept the world. And I, I think they kept the cruiserweight and the tag. And I mean, you just saw a lot of people, you know, you had your challengers and then people just kind of just having matches just to have matches. And I'm not saying that that's what we're going to enter. Cause you know, there is the X division championship, which, which is no weight limits, obviously, but it just makes you wonder for some of the people who probably don't fit that mold you know, are, is Don going to change his mind and decide, hey, you know, maybe we do need to have a mid-card championship. So, you know, but we just have to wait and see. Yep. So moving on, we had, they announced that Tessa versus Andy is happening at the pay-per-view. Then we had another promo backstage of, well, so they, they Moose saying about uh, he's not happy what happened to D'Angelo and payback's a bitch. I'm not going to dwell on this because we've talked about Moose at length before. I know you like the guy. Uh, I, you know, I, I can see D'Angelo interfering and turning here on having a feud with Moose without the belt. That's where I would like it to go, to be honest, because I just don't think Moose has got, you know, I don't think he, he he's ready for the belt just yet. And I know he's been with, in the industry a long time now, <laughs> certainly with Impact, but I still don't think he's ready. Right, so then we had the Madison Rain sit-down interview. W what did you think of this, by the way? All right, I... As great as this show show was for me, this was the one, and <laughs> I feel like I'm coming across as being a Madison Rain hater, and I'm not. I'm just not feeling this whole feud between her and Sue Young. I it's just, and then just the way this came off, I just, I get what they were trying to do. It's just, I don't know. I'm just, I'm not invested in. I don't want to see <laughs> Madison Rain challenging Sue Young, and I know that's what we're gonna see. So I think the fact that I uh, have that uh, opinion on it, it's hard for me to really kind of look at it from a positive perspective. Okay, let's just say this was Ali in this situation, having this sit-down interview and the the horror story cliches. Would you have liked the segment, or do you still think the segment itself was poor? I think I would have accepted it more just because there was more of a backstory. Because I think when you're looking, when you're talking about Allie, you could play off, you know, Sue Young burying her best friend in Rosemary. And, you know, it took her to the edge. It's just, I don't know, with the whole Madison Rain push, and I apologize, listeners, for beating a dead horse. It just kind of just came out of nowhere. And I know that, you know, a lot of people believe, like, you know, this is just to help Sue Young. I really don't see where Sue Young's going to benefit from this because it just seems like they just most recently started interacting with one another. You know, her, you know, the first couple of weeks, it was just Madison Rain and Tessa. And then, mm -hmm. you know, she moved on to Taya and then, then it was Sue Young. So I don't know, this whole thing, I just want them to get it over with, to be on, quite honest. It'll be interesting to see what Sue Young's actually like on the mic if she ever does do some talking because, uh, you know, we'll, we'll come back to the end of this segment because they, they split it up weirdly of having a match in between the interview and then the payoff. Um, but 
you know, she's been very good in these segments, but I think that's more the production of the segments. But it'll be interesting at some point, they can't keep doing this time in, time out, you know, with all her challenges. At some point, she's going to have to talk in the ring. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if she can do that. All right, we'll come back to it to finish off the show. But Ovi and Sami Callahan versus Pentagon Jr., Phoenix and Rich Swan. Now, this was a cracker. This was really good. Yes, most certainly, man. I mean, from top to bottom, man, this was a pay-per-view quality style match. And I love that the participants, I mean, well, I guess in the case of Pentagon Jr. and Sammy Callahan, you know, they have a feud brewing. And, uh, yeah, this was just all balls to the wall. And, you know, it's so funny that one of my takeaways from the match was, you know, you think of the super kick. You know, that was a move just that was associated with Shawn Michaels. And, I mean, I know others have used it. And then you think of the cutter, which is a move diamond dallas page you think of randy orton and the way that these guys were using these moves as just regular moves it just you know shows you the difference in different companies and uh i like i had tweeted this on social media jake chris his cutter is greater than everyone else's you can't tell me otherwise i mean this guy the timing of that his move we've seen him do this at redemption where he got moves for it through a table how he was able to time Rich Swan and get it like that and connect with it. Because, you know, when you're talking about, you know, jumping off of something and then trying to uh, connect with a move as such, you know, it's easy to mistime your jump or anything. And, man, he's just excellent in that role. But this this, this, this was uh, phenomenal. And, you know, and i seen some criticism online. And, I mean, I, it, it was something I overlooked. Where they had a, I think a sequence between Pentagon and Phoenix. They hit some type of move on uh, on uh, Callahan, and it looked like it was going to be the three, but he had kicked out, and they were critical of it. It was no big deal. I think you got to build Callahan up. So having him kick it out of the pen, uh, Pentagon's finisher and kicking out of that double team move, I think that'll help him leading to the pay per view. But and then I, I was happy that he actually got the win too. I would have rather to see him pin Phoenix or hell even pin Pentagon, but you know I have no problem with him pinning Swan. But all around great, great main event. Yeah, the, the kicking out of finishes thing. Uh, you know, I, I think on regular shows it should never happen. You know, in this kind of match, you can have a finisher which doesn't end it. You know, because you could have Jake or Dave, you know, breaking it up, which is the way they should have gone. But I, I don't like clean kickouts. Of, of finishers i just think it devalues things you're talking about the super kick you know and and uh, the cutter as, as finishers in other companies um i, I just think finishers are under protected these days you know that that everyone seems to kick out of them and I, and I don't like it i really don't like it i think it, it should be the exclamation point on on the match but there you go but no this match was fantastic and uh yeah uh, you know, once again, one thing Impact has done better than any other company out there, as far as I'm concerned. And I know we're obviously reviewing Impact week in, week out, but, you know, I do catch other, uh, other shows now and again, is that their character development, they don't rush things. You know, the way that Callahan and OVE have been built up has been excellent. The way, you know, Killer Cross, Ali, all these characters, even uh, Laurel Van Ness, you know, when you think back to it, that they build up characters over, they're not afraid to play the long game, even despite the fact that the roster usually leaves before. Before the end of the promo um you know the, but but they, they do this very well and and the you know callahan was on the the teleconference this week which which is good uh, if you haven't heard it check it out i'm sure bq might post it to the channel but he lives and breathes that character and it, I, I don't think there's a better heel in the industry at the moment and don't get me wrong you know killer cross i think is, is great you know those kind of things in in small segments but i think as a someone who just lives the character and someone who is constantly on and, you know, in different promotions, Callahan is one of the best in the business at the moment. Yeah, I couldn't agree anymore. Right. So, um, we won't dwell on, on that match. I mean, it was it was really good. You know, this you know the, the actual in ring segment section talks for itself, so we don't need to go much further into it. But let's get back to the Sue Young and Madison Rain, where she suddenly appears in the forest. Now, now wait up before before I go on to that. What do you think of segments like this within the context of an Impact show? Because you, you get people like Tessa Blanchard who are wrestling in the Knockouts division, and it's all very real. You know, if you get hit, you get hit, you get hurt. You don't have all this supernatural stuff. But 
so most of the time impact is real day real life day-to-day stuff but then they throw in this mystical stuff and i know they do a lot of this on lucha underground etc i don't always watch that but do you think it has a place in impact or do you think it's just hokey i think it's fine i I, if i had to say the one thing that i kind of find corny is just the music that they have associated with it at times it's just (laughs) i think that's what it comes across as cheesy because when watching this i was reminded and i i thought this was and i i think we had reviewed this and you weren't a fan of it but remember the backstage segment they had where uh, rosemary she had jumped off i want to say like that trailer onto uh taya yeah yeah i remember that yeah yeah and you know i liked it you know but i, I just think sometimes the music just that's what kind of makes it cheesy but i think it fits with certain characters and when you think about what someone like a su young you know it fits her it fits her character so I don't have a problem. Like I said, I just think sometimes maybe the music that they use is kind of a. Uh... Yeah, see, see I, I usually love segments like this, and I thought this one was actually better than most. I, I always criticize the editing, you know, of it, but I thought this one was done very well, actually. And I love the ending with uh, Sue Young covering the, the camera lens, you know, looking like she was grabbing Addy, uh, not Addy, Madison by the face. I thought it was very well done. The only problem I have with it is next week, obviously, Madison is going to come out as if nothing's happened, you know. So, it, it you know, I, I feel sometimes the payoff from these segments don't work. But anyway, um, yeah, that was this week's show, and, and from top to bottom, I thought it was excellent. That that I can't think of any criticism other than the Desi Hit Squad. Um, other than that, I, I, I thought the show w- was top notch, and uh, you know, every time I do one of these reviews, I keep saying, you know, the show is really on the right track, and and, and hopefully things will improve. You know, I, I said on the last, I, and actually I didn't say it on the last show, on the first BQ show that you did uh, on my vacation, I commented that. I feel that there's a real change on social media. You know, when you look at some of the dirt sheets, the reviews, you know, I look at Wrestling Inc. as an example, or WrestleZone, the comments are very much swayed now towards pro impact. You still get the odd troll, but whereas before, you know, it was most probably 80-20 in anti-impact comments now it, it's virtually flipped that you know 90 percent of the stuff is, is very this was a great show really enjoying what impact are doing it's better than wwe so I, I think they're on the right track and i just think it's the wrestling business and tv viewership is never going to change now uh, unless they can find a way to reignite the wars i still don't think that that we'll ever get back to where we were with it but impact as a show has been brilliant yeah, you know, in at the end of the day, I've always st- stood uh, consistent with this. And I guess I understand, you know, in the grand scheme of things, obviously you want the positive publicity. But, I mean, you know, I see on social media, you know, you got a bunch of people every week complaining about how terrible Raw is, yet they tune in. You know, they complain about Roman Reigns' push, yet they still pay the tickets. So I think what's starting to happen is people are finding again alternatives to one company you know even if you know loyal impact fans who appreciate impact you know they're starting to or if they haven't already you know watching these ring of honors rise new japan all these different promotions but you know you hit the nail on the head i think at the end of the day wrestling is where it is i mean it's wwe and everyone else and that's what has more to do with the fact that they're the long tenured company i mean when you think about impact in i mean if you want to bring in the tna history what they they've been around 16 years you're comparing 16 years to i mean how how long i don't know i I'm sure over 20 years obviously with the e and then you know i don't know the other companies so the thing that i'm happy about is they're not reacting too much to the dirt sheets they're sticking to the basics and the old uh don's uh old school booking that's what i love like he in you know you had brought up mention with austin aries how when the fans were chanting his name and how austin aries was quick to say hey i know my name staying in hill character because we see now you know some of these hills want to be the cool hills where they're doing moves to try to get the the pops and you don't need to see that in a hill. So Don bringing, well, I don't, I don't want to just say Don. I'll, just, I'll say this regime, bringing back that old school feel. I think that's what's helped. And, you know, even too, you know, you think about this is the third week in a row, you know, for these reviews where, you know, we've went longer than expected. But there's so much to talk about, man. These shows have just been 
excellent must-see television. It's very exciting to be a fan. And, I mean, you think about our last pay-per-view was April. They've been building Slammiversary since then. And, I mean, you think we're a week away, but by the time this drops, you know, it'll be a few days away. And, you know, excited. I think everyone's excited. There's that good, positive feel. There's not, we're not going into it just thinking like, man, they really got to hit this in the park or everything is going to fail. It's like we already f- expect it to be great. You know, we're just excited to see what happens. What a brilliant way to finish the show. Uh, unless, of course, you want to do a rundown of next week. But those sentiments, uh, I, I share them wholeheartedly. A- anything for next week? Any Any matches announced? You know what? They didn't announce anything. Um, I guess I'm just gonna assume we're gonna get the Killer Cross, P.D. Williams. But uh, yeah, man, I just I just wanted because I was looking at the time and I just remember the past couple of uh, reviews. You know, BQ and I did while you were on vacation. You know, they went over the standard time that we do, but it's just like, man, you know, the progress has just been excellent. You know, there's so much to talk about. I feel like when some of our reviews are shorter, it's because you know that we find a lot of things that we don't necessarily like so yeah anyway so yeah just just to finish up the show then um make sure you do hit subscribe leave us some comments below a quick reminder of the trivia question was what was the very first bound for glory main event and uh i think did i ask who the guest referee was i'll give you a clue it's not scarlet bordeaux and uh yeah and then obviously follow us on twitter if you can let's see if i can get my followers up it'll be nice so i'm at v the letter to the number wrestling show and row is RT, let's remind us rt great underscore rt great underscore let's get some more viewers but thanks for stopping by make sure you hit that subscribe uh and the like have a thumbs up thumbs down we really don't care we'll be back next week leave your comments below we'll catch up soon